And now, the start of a major new series. It's Scotland's Music, a radio history, which we'll be broadcasting weekly for the next 30 weeks. Scotland's Music is written and presented by John Purser, and he calls this first programme Birds, Bulls and Boars. The history of Scottish music has been heard on BBC Radio more than once before, but this history is something different. For a start, each programme is 90 minutes long, so we're able to play complete pieces of music, not just examples. And for a second, there are going to be 30 programmes. This means that I've been able to combine classical and traditional music. They're indispensable to each other, and particularly in Scotland, have been intertwined from earliest times. Some programmes will contain only classical, some only traditional music, but most will combine both. We start with the melting of the ice cap and end at the end of the second millennium AD, about 8,000 years of musical sounds. The first 6,000 years are covered in this first programme, but in it we will hear broadcast original Bronze Age horns and rattles and Scotland's oldest surviving playable musical instrument. The first are 3,000 years old and the second 2,000 years old. But every programme, be it medieval plain chant and ballad, Renaissance choral music, 17th century bagpipe and classic music, 18th century enlightened music, 19th century romantic music, or 20th century every kind of music, will have first modern performances or broadcasts of music composed by Scots in Scotland. And of traditional music we will hear many very beautiful things from Shetland to the borders, hard to come by and going deep into our consciousness. What's also fascinating is that music has been such a vital part of the story of Scotland that it illuminates our whole history and often helps to clarify it. For instance, one piece casts light on the intrigues of Mary Queen of Scots, another on the events that led to the Treaty of Union. But it is in the end the beauty of the music that matters. Hearing is the deepest of our senses, music the subtlest expression of it. And this country, for its size and population, one of the most distinctive and fertile sources of it. And radio is the only medium through which a history of Scottish music can be properly presented, for on radio you hear it. Shut your eyes if you like, but open your ears, for this is our heritage, our music, and yet most of it will be as new as a newborn child. Birds were the first musicians, which is why you're listening to a bird, itself stimulated maybe by the sound of the stream beside it. This is a snow bunting, perhaps after the Ice Age, the first living thing to utter musical sounds in the country we now call Scotland. They're with us still, nesting on the high tops, and if there's one unbroken thread in the history of Scottish music to match that of the snow bunting, it is the love of nature and a continual returning to that source expressed by our love for our own traditional music, which honours nature always. So I've chosen the snow bunting as our musical emblem, for it sings its little splinters of song in the most remote places and with scant encouragement, just as we have had to do. And thanks to a similar tenacity, we are still breeding music as successfully as in our remotest past. Kjol is the Gaelic word for music, only it doesn't really mean the same thing as it's nothing whatever to do with Greek muses. Kjol means a sound like the sounds that birds make. It relates etymologically to pipalo, pipe, pib, and pibrich, and to pipe like the birds. The connection between birdsong and music is not a mere fancy or dependent solely on the etymology of the word kjol, for even nowadays a man imitating the pipes sounds a bit like a bird. Pilly, 
The music Callum Johnson was singing there is very old, derived from the pre-Christian laments and perhaps ultimately from birdsong. The people of Isla used to call one of the seabirds the kuntich, or bird of lament, whose cry heard in the night anticipated a death and also represented the cries of the mourners, in particular the women keening. The call of the red shank is as near to the cry of Pili Liliu as you can ask for. Those syllables, Pili Liliu, were also used in Ireland for the lament. We'll return to the keen or lament in later programmes, but meanwhile, here is the same tune, Pili Liliu, sung by Mary McMaster, but this time in the spirit of a lament. And finally, here is Pili Liliu on the pipes played by Alan MacDonald, starting with the note which to this day is called the note of sorrow by pipers. The high G, a note whose tuning in the bagpipe scale gives it a peculiar and intense quality, especially when it falls to the note below. As it does over and over in this tune. As for bagpipes sounding like birds, Martin Martin, a reporter from the Isle of Skye, travelling in the 1690s, tells us, The Gorlin is a fowl less than a duck. The piper of St Kilda plays the notes which it sings, and hath composed a tune of him, which the natives judge to be very fine music. There's also a famous pibruch, a set of pipe variations, called the Battle of the Birds. Some of the more elaborate cuttings or decorations in pipe music are very bird-like.
People still teach their children to recognise birds by putting bird song into words. Many of us will know the yellow hammer by his little bit of bread, no cheese. But here are some of the people of Barra, with a remarkable variety of bird imitations, which also serve to show that between bird song and music, and music and words, and words and bird song, there need be no clear boundaries. First, the lark. <laughs> Now the thrush. Each phrase repeated just as the thrush likes to do. That's John, son of little Mary. Hitchyachi, Hitchyachi, come home, come home. Kotiki, Kotiki, hot too, hot too. Kotinias, Kotinias, to your dinner, to your dinner. Change genius, change genius, hot dinner, hot dinner. Aran Kruy Kulistag, Aran Kostagas, Muklish. Hard dry bread, old bread, and whey with it, whey with it. Be clish, be clish, be quick, be quick. Stranger by far, but just as observant, are these bird calls. Low, low, low. Coon, a coon, a car of rouge. Hanashokalach, a horse, Hanashokalach, a horse. Coon, a coon, a car of rouge. Low, low, low. The song of the grouse means lie down, lie down, sleep. You won't get any more till the morning. Save the, the bloom of the heather, save the bloom of the heather. birds are enticing their young off the cliff, you see. They, they go in front of them and they, sh they, they sit, make these sounds. The, the first sound is the puffin and the next sound is the razor bill. And the langi, I don't know the, the English name for it, makes mm -hmm. the third sound that you mm -hmm. heard. It's, it's, the, it's the parent birds enticing the younger ones uh, on the wing. Of course, these connections between birdsong and music and speech and piping can't be given a time of commencement. Human speech is as old as humans, but in what language, if not perhaps the language of birds? But in Scotland in 8000 BC, the snow bunting still had 2000 years of peace before man even camped on our coasts, arriving, perhaps from Denmark, to hunt and to fish. Creatures were much tamer then, but even so, if you want to catch birds without a gun, it helps if you can cheat them into friendship. One way is to imitate their calls with the voice, as we have heard, or with a pipe. Pipes are as old as man's ability to take a bird bone, which is naturally hollow, and blow through it, perhaps adding a hole in the side to add a note, if there wasn't one knocked out of it already. This bird bone pipe is a reconstruction of one found on the coast of Denmark, dating from 5000 BC. It was probably used to imitate black guillemots, common enough on the Scottish coast to this day, for the purpose of catching them for food. You can hear the pipe on a high, repeated note in the foreground and the young birds imitating it in the background. <laughs> 